What's up, everybody? This is your boy Tech G back with another video to help you successfully pass the CompTIA 220 1001 examination. So let's get into it. In this video, you will learn about network host services such as various server roles, internet appliances, and legacy and embedded systems. Let's talk about a web server. So a web server is server software or hardware that is dedicated to running software <laughs> that can satisfy client requests on the world wide web. A web server can contain one or more websites. A web server processes incoming network requests over HTTP and several other related protocols. The primary function of a web server is to store process and deliver web pages to clients. The communication between client and server takes place using hypertext transfer protocol or HTTP. Pages delivered are most frequently HTML documents, which may include images, style sheets, and scripts in addition to the text content. Web hosts have become essential in business and education, and setting up a web server is a common task for an IT professional. A file server is a server that provides access to files. A file server acts as a central file storage location that can be accessed by multiple systems. File servers are typically computers with a single large drive or a RAID array for storage. File servers are commonly found in enterprise settings such as company networks, but they are also used in schools, small organizations, and even home networks. Dedicated servers are used only for storage. A computer that shares storage and also performs standalone tasks is known as a non-dedicated server. A network attached storage or NAS device is a type of file server designed to store large amounts of data in a central location on the network. A print server is a type of server that connects printers to client computers over a network. It accepts print jobs from the computer and sends the jobs to the appropriate printers, queuing the jobs locally to accommodate the fact that work may arrive more quickly than the printer can actually handle. And similar functions include the ability to inspect the queue of jobs to be processed, the ability to reorder or delete waiting print jobs, or the ability to do various kinds of accounting, such as counting pages, which may involve reading data generated by the printers. Print servers may be used to enforce administration policies such as color printing quotas, user department authentication, or watermarking printed documents. A print server may be a network computer with one or more shared printers. Alternatively, a print server may be a dedicated device on the network with connections to the LAN and one or more printers. Dedicated server appliances tend to be fairly simple in both configuration and features. Print server functionality may be integrated with other devices such as a wireless router, a firewall, or both. A DHCP or a dynamic host configuration protocol server is a network server that automatically provides and assigns IP addresses, default gateways, and other network parameters to client devices. A DHCP server automatically sends the required network parameters for clients to properly communicate on the network. Without it, the network administrator has to manually set up every client that joins the network work which can be cumbersome, especially in large networks. DHCP servers usually assign each client with a unique dynamic IP address, which changes when the client's lease for that IP address has expired. DHCP server functions are included in Soho routers and are typical roles for domain controllers on small to medium business networks. On larger networks, DHCP servers are often separate physical or virtualized servers. A domain name system or a DNS server is the phone book of the Internet. Humans access information through domain names like technologyg.com 
Web browsers interact through internet protocol addresses or IP addresses. DNS translates domain names to IP addresses so browsers can load internet resources. DNS server functions are included in Soho routers. Separate DNS servers can be used for larger networks. The DNS server communicates with other larger DNS servers if the requested addresses are not in its database. A proxy server is a server application or appliance that acts as an intermediary for requests from clients seeking resources from servers that provide those resources. A proxy server thus functions on behalf of the client when requesting service, potentially masking the true origin of the request to the resource server. Instead of connecting directly to a server that can fulfill a requested resource, such as a file or web page, the client directs the request to the proxy server, which evaluates the request and performs the required network transactions. If the proxy server does not have the requested web page, it downloads the page on behalf of the client, sends the page to the client, and retains a copy of the page in its cache. This serves as a method to simplify or control the complexity of the request or provide additional benefits such as load balancing, privacy, or security. Proxy servers can also be used for anonymous web surfing. A mail server is the computerized equivalent of your neighborhood mailman. A mail server sends or receives email on a network. Every email that is sent passes through a series of mail servers along its way to its intended recipient. An SMTP or simple mail transfer protocol server is used to send outgoing email. In either a POP3 or a post office protocol version 3 or IMAP, which stands for Internet Message Access Protocol Server, is used to receive mail. Mail server apps are available from many vendors such as Yahoo, Gmail, Hotmail, etc. An authentication server provides a network service that applications use to authenticate the credentials, such as usernames and passwords or their actual users. Usernames and permissions are then stored in this central server, which provides security certificates to users and records users' logins to the network. When the client submits a valid set of credentials, it receives a cryptographic ticket that it can subsequently use to access various services. Authentication is used as the basis for authorization, which is the determination whether a privilege may be granted to a particular user or process. It also enables privacy, which keeps information from becoming known to non-participants. And it also implements a concept called non-repudiation, which is the ability to deny having done something that was authorized to be done based on the authentication. Basically, that stands for you cannot deny that you actually did this. Like there's proof out there saying that, hey, this only could have been done from you or your account. Syslog server. So in computing, syslog is a standard for message logging. It allows separation of the software that generates messages, the system that stores them, and the software that reports and analyzes them. Each message is labeled with a facility code, including the software type generating the message and a severity level that is assigned to the message. Syslog servers are used to collect syslog messages in a single location in addition to tracking events that happen on devices on a network. A syslog server might be a physical server, a standalone virtual machine, or a software-based service. All right, in the next couple sections, we're going to talk about internet appliances. So an internet appliance, they are single purpose devices that are used to perform specific tasks on an IP network. UTM or Unified Threat Management. This is an approach to information security where a single hardware or software installation provides multiple security functions. UTM devices provide firewall, remote access, VPN support, web traffic filtering with anti-malware, and network intrusion prevention. 
This contrasts with the traditional method of having point solutions for each security function. UTM simplifies information security management by providing a single management and reporting point for the security administrator rather than managing multiple products from different vendors. UTM devices may be specialized boxes that are placed between the organization's network and the internet, but they can also be virtual machines using cloud-based services. UTM appliances have gained popularity since 2009, partly because the all-in-one approach simplifies installation, configuration, and maintenance. Such a setup saves time, money, and people when compared to the management of multiple security systems. IDS. So an intrusion detection system is a device or software application that monitors a network or systems for malicious activity or policy violations that might not be detected by the firewall. Typical threats detected by an IDS include attacks against services, malware attacks, data-driven attacks, and host-based attacks. To detect these threats, a typical IDS uses signature-based detection, detection of unusual activities, also known as anomalies, and stateful protocol analysis. Any intrusion activity or violation is typically reported either to an administrator or collected centrally using a security information and event management system or a SIEM system. A SIEM system combines outputs from multiple sources and uses alarm filtering techniques to distinguish malicious activity from false alarms. A true IDS does not block attacks, but some products and services that are referred to as IDS actually have the characteristics of an IPS, which stands for Intrusion Prevention System. And speaking of IPS, so an intrusion prevention system, which is also known as an intrusion detection prevention system or an IDPS, is a technology that keeps an eye on a network for any malicious activities attempting to exploit a known vulnerability. An IPS's main function is to identify any suspicious activity and either detect and allow it, which is the IDS functionality, or prevent and block the threat, which will be the IPS functionality. So the main thing you need to understand when it comes to the difference between IDS and IPS is that IDS simply detects potential threats to the network, but it doesn't do anything other than possibly reporting on it. IPS can detect and report and also do something about it, such as stopping the threat. So that is the difference between IDS and IPS. Endpoint management server. So an endpoint management server allows for IT departments to centrally manage and distribute operating system updates and software application updates. Endpoint management servers also provide a single administrative console for managing device security policies, asset inventory, and compliance reporting for supported devices. Legacy and embedded systems. So a legacy system is an old method, technology, computer system, or application program that is still in use. Often referencing a system as legacy means that it paved the way for the standards that would follow it. This can also imply that the system is out of date or in need of a replacement. Maintaining legacy systems is often necessary when newer products are not compatible with legacy applications. For example, applications that can run only under Microsoft DOS or old versions of Windows. If a legacy operating system and its applications can be run in a virtualized environment, the problems of maintaining old hardware are eliminated. An embedded system is a computer system that has a dedicated function within a larger mechanical or electrical system, such as machine control, point of sale systems, or ATMs. It is embedded as part of a complete device, often including electrical or electronic hardware and mechanical parts. Because an embedded system typically controls physical operations of the machine that it is embedded within, 
It often has real-time computing constraints. Embedded systems control many devices in common use today. 98% of all microprocessors manufactured are used in embedded systems. Now, legacy and embedded systems both present big potential security risks. If a legacy system or an embedded system has network or internet connectivity, it theoretically could be attacked or used as a bot to attack other systems. Now, some issues that need to be taken into consideration when deciding whether to update a legacy or an embedded system are, will the existing data be usable with newer apps? Can the existing program run with current operating systems? Will changes in network security, wireless or internet standards, such as the change over to IP version six, cause problems with the application? Can a proprietary application be licensed to run in a virtual machine? Does existing hardware used in the embedded system work with the new operating system? And does the embedded application run on current embedded operating systems? If not, is an update version available? So those are some of the things that you need to keep in mind when deciding on whether or not you want to update a legacy or an embedded system. All right. So let's go ahead and get into some check on learning, shall we? First question is, which of the following describes a system that maps domain names to various types of data, such as numerical IP addresses? Is it TCP IP? Is it DNS? Is it SQL? Or is it DHCP. Which of the following describes a system that maps domain names to various types of data, such as numerical IP addresses? The correct answer is uh, DNS or domain name system. Remember that this is the phone book of the internet, ladies and gentlemen. It takes a name like Technology G, Google, Facebook, YouTube, whatever, converts it to or matches it up with its numerical IP address and then sends you on your merry little way to visit those websites, all right? Next question. Which network protocol enables users to retrieve the contents of an internet page from a web server? Is it SNMP? Is it HTTP? Is it SMTP or is it IMAP? So which network protocol enables users to retrieve the contents of an internet page from a web server? The correct answer is uh, HTTP or Hypertext Transfer Protocol will allow for you to do that. And the final question is uh, IMAP is used for what? Is it serving web pages? Is it translating domain names into IP addresses? Is it retrieving email messages from a mail server or is it sending email messages? So what is IMAP used for? The correct answer is uh, retrieving emails from a mail server. So how IMAP works is you have a email message sitting on a mail server somewhere like Gmail, Yahoo, Hotmail, or whatever. If you want to look at that email on your computer and then you want to go look at it on your mobile device at the same time or at different times, you would have to set up your mail application for IMAP, especially your mail application on your mobile device. That will allow for you to look at the mail on both devices at the same time or at different times or however you want to do it. All right. So in summary, ladies and gentlemen, we have talked about network host services such as various server roles, Internet appliances and legacy and embedded systems. Now, if you felt like you got something valuable out of all of this information, please go ahead and hit the like, share drop a comment, and most importantly, subscribe to this channel. Also visit my website, technologyg.com, so that you can get read up on the latest and greatest to help you successfully pass the CompTIA A plus 220 1001 examination. And until next video, ladies and gentlemen, peace.